Good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Steinwan, and I teach in the English department. And hopefully my pictures will come up soon. Well, my topic today is um, how the zombie apocalypse can help us think about climate change. Zombie apocalypse, you're probably thinking. How can this help us think about climate change? Well, I am hoping that most of you were here to hear some of the real science behind climate change and, and, and you know about the reality of it. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about how we can think about climate change um, because it's such a problem to get our head around. Um, it's hard to imagine what, what the future is holding. So for most of the past year, I've been chewing on an idea. I've been noticing a violent and apocalyptic trend in our popular culture, particularly in novels, comic books, films, TV shows, and video games. Now, please understand that I am not a zombie apocalypse fanatic. I bet many of you in this room um, know more about the current trend than I do. In fact, let's see. Um, raise your hand if you have seen um, at least two of the works on the screen. Seen or read two of the works on the screen. Okay. How many of you have seen or read four of the works on the screen? Okay, not, no experts here. Okay. Um, and not all of these, you notice, are, are zombie apocalypse, but I, but I want to bring them into the conversation because I'm seeing a pattern here towards apocalypse and an interest in apocalypse. So at least a third of you are probably more aware of this trend, more um, up to date on this trend than I am. Um, but I want you to chew on this idea with me for a little bit for the next few minutes. Um, if you get the the Dead Me app um, from The Walking Dead, um, as, as my daughter, sitting in the back, um, took this picture of me. You can dead yourself um, with the help of The Walking Dead application. So I'm using that as a template for grossing you out. So chew on this idea with me for, for a few minutes. What is it we're afraid of? And how does this fear make us behave? What social anxiety do the zombies incarnate? What assets, values, and abilities do we and our communities have that can help us face our fear? Because a lot of the zombie apocalypse narratives are about fighting off the zombies, and you have to get your community together to, to fight them off. Often the community turns on each other, and then you start... Um, questioning, you know, who is the them? Is it the zombies or is it the others amongst us who are not, a, not with us? So if you were at chapel this morning, Stuart Herman gave a, a brilliant, beautiful meditation on resilience. And I think there's a lot in zombie apocalypse narratives about community resilience because it's how people come together. How resilient are we and should we be as communities so we are ready to face this fear rather than turn with violence on each other. So these are some of the questions that I think the zombie apocalypse can help us explore. Of course, zombies are not really a new thing. We can trace the gothic horror science fiction story of reanimated corpses back at least 200 years to Samuel Taylor Coleridge's The Rime of the Ancient Mariner and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus, which Frankenstein, by the way, was writ written in a year that was called in England the year without a summer. And that was because a number of volcanoes were going on at the time. And so Frankenstein and works written at this time are being looked at by um, romantic scholars, romantic literature scholars, as um, being aware of, of climate change and, and the impact. Um, Mary Shelley's second novel that, that um, is, 
it was becoming more and more popular. It was one of the most talked about novels at the International Conference on Romanticism last fall. The Last Man is about um, a survivor of a plague um, who's dealing with apocalypse. So what were the English afraid of when Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein and, and Coleridge wrote The Reign of the Ancient Mariner? Well, there was anxiety about political and economic change after the French Revolution and um, the changes that came after with the Industrial Revolution. So there were concerns about um, what people were doing to the planet and to each other. And there was growing concern about participation in the slave trade as well. So these anxieties become metaphors that become incarnated with the monster, um, the creature. And there's a lot of literary criticism that looks at, you know, what does the creature represent? And there's, there's lots of competing discourse about this. But monsters throughout this history of the Gothic um, have incarnated our fears and um, collected our our collective unconscious um, anxieties, paranoias, fears. So it's so it's worth thinking about that. And and the monsters are also in a way unnatural. So it's so it's what what is unnatural that we're concerned about. So the point is isn't here um, that the author really intended for this equation to be made. Um, the point is more what fear is dramatized. For example, um, I'll get to this one in a minute, but I don't have a slide for this next one. Um, in the 1950s, there was a movie called The Invasion of the B Body Snatchers, um, loosely based on a Robert Louis, Louis Stevenson um, short story and then remade in, in several other versions after, after the 50s. Um, aliens have come and they've taken over the neighbor's bodies. Um, and so this, this story is, is about alien invasion. Um, but at the time, this was 1956, this was the era of the McCarthy trials. And so the, the communist Red Scare was, was, was around and people were worried about communists. Um, and people were worried that their neighbors were communists and so forth. So the, par the paranoia of the collective unconscious was that they're among us and they are us and they're coming to get us. So this idea of, of paranoia is, is, you know, all over the place. Historically, narratives of, ap of apocalypse and monstrous invasions can be traced to collective unconscious anxieties and threats um, of a particular time. But it was George Romero's 1968 film, Night of the Living Dead, that linked Hollywood's sensationalization of, vo of the voodoo zombie to the social and political anxieties of 1968. Well, what's going on in 1968? The Vietnam War, interracial tensions lingering from the civil rights movement, the threat of nuclear war, a generation gap, and the assassin assassinations of key leaders. Um, so the Living Dead, the Night of the Living Dead and, and its sequ sequels um, really kind of captured the collective paranoias of that generation. And... In a, in a really subversive way and, and made the horror genre a much more subversive genre than it was before that. And, the, and this continues to a certain extent. The sequels of the Living Dead series continue in the 1980s when Dawn of the Dead traps the zombies in a shopping mall to illustrate the fear that consumerism has turned us into zombies. And so connecting with Andrew's presentation about consumerism, you know, is, is it... Is it consumerism that has driven us to become these zombies? And what have we lost in the process? So what anxieties are eating at us in this current zombie apocalypse trend? After 9-11, we, we probably would have said terrorism. We're afraid of terrorism. We have this collective fear that terrorists are among, amongst us and they're coming to get us. And now after the Boston Marathon, that anxiety has resurfaced as a possibility for interpretation. The ongoing wars in Iraq and Afghanistan might call our attention to um, what we are doing to um, people on other, in other parts of the world. But I am here today to suggest that we consider our social and cultural anxiety about climate change and begin to take responsibility for facing this fear. 
the other speakers today should convince us that we need to be concerned about climate change and our impact on it. But science needs art and imaginative narrative to help us imagine and motivate us to do something in response. As a slow-moving and mostly invisible violence, however, climate change presents a, a representational challenge to storytellers. How can we imagine the effects of climate change in a way that captures our attention and moves us to take action? Rob Nixon is a post-colonial eco-critic at the University of Wisconsin-Madison who raises the question of how writers face the challenge of representing slow violence through narrative to call attention to the social and environmental injustices that unevenly affect the poor. For Nixon, slow violence includes attritional catastrophes like nu nuclear radiation, chemical poisoning, pesticide drift, and oil spills that may get initially media, media attention when there is some dramatic and visual spectacle to behold, but the people who live at the scene do not have the luxury of forgetting and moving on to the next spectacular disaster. Rather, they need to consolidate their community assets, values, and abilities to face their crises and bounce back from disaster. So the zombie apocalypse gives us a kind of metaphor. It gives us a kind of dramatic spectacle to call our attention. The current trend in popular apocalyptic narrative distracts our attention, however, from the spectacle of violence, or it distracts our attention with the spectacle of violence um, against the undead or dehumanized other. And the issues of community resilience are too often reduced to an us versus them mentality. I am afraid it is also le leading us to a, a sort of doomsday preppers style of accumulating as many weapons as we, as we can and as much ammunition to protect ourselves from the others who we fear will be after us when water, food, and other prized resources are scarce. Still, the questions of resilience are apparent in these stories. So my goal today with this talk is to get you chewing with me on this idea that the zombie apocalypse can help us think about climate change. For even more perspective, however, on, this, on the slow violence of climate change, I want to recommend two eco-feminist science fiction works. First, the, Met, the Mad Adam trilogy by Margaret Atwood, um, which includes Oryx and Crake and The Year of the Flood, um, students in my um, in, um, global literature and environmental justice class um, will read one or the other of these, the first two in this trilogy. September 3rd, the third part of the trilogy comes out called Mad Adam, um, and so I'm looking forward to the release of that. These novels are set in a post-apocalyptic world where the corporations have taken over, the environment is trashed, and genetic engineering has gone a bit wild. But Atkins' world here is uncannily, uncannily not so far from where we are now. Um, so it kind of serves as a satire of, of where we are now. A little less apocalyptic than, than Atwood's trilogy is Barbara Kingsolver's Flight Behavior, um, very recently released, in which a young woman of modest means learns that the changing climate has led the monarch butterflies to roost in her Appalachian woods of Tennessee, instead of Mexico, where they usually roost, an effect of climate change. These works are part of an emerging trend of climate fiction, or as, as I heard on NPR a couple of days ago, cli-fi. Um, so, but I think it's important to put these in connection with Rob Nixon's ideas about slow violence, that dramatizing this crisis is difficult um, because it's imaginatively difficult to get our heads around this slow-moving violence until it's too late. You know, it's, it, w when, when the climate has changed so dramatically um, that our lives are affected, then we'll notice. But in the meantime, how do we imagine because by then it's going to be too late. So science fiction um, can help us imagine these. And the horror genre itself can help us imagine these these possibilities if we start talking about it, if we start thinking about it. So reading such works as Atwood's and Kingsolver's alongside these zombie stories can help us think about climate change and take it seriously. So when you go to World War Z this summer, I think it's coming out um, as, a, as a film, um, 
think about climate change in relation to this.